Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, this whole corporate compliance thing, HIPAA thing, it's a little complex. Well, we've all thought that. Well, in today's podcast, we bring back Linda Harvey, who was a hero of ours in the COVID conference, and she helps us decode all of this in trouble-free dentistry, unpacking corporate compliance laws in this great industry. What you need to know today and coming down the pipeline. So make sure you guys listen up. I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. I always say this, you know the jam around here, but my job is to bring you the best thinkers, the best teachers, the best leaders in dentistry to help you create a better practice and a better life. And we're bringing back one of the heroes in the ACT Dental community who saved us during the COVID conference, Linda Harvey. And Linda is going to be talking about some of the things that you need to know when it comes to regulatory compliance and some of the changes just to keep you up to date. And keep you in the know. So, Linda, thanks for coming back. I appreciate you as always. Oh, well, thank you, Kirk. And save the day. I think it took a team back during COVID, but thank you. It's good to be back. Uh, no, you did save the day because uh, in a world now, many people know this if they've been listening, uh, but we we hit the panic button and I had mm -hmm. like I was having a panic attack and I don't do well when we uh, can't predict the future. And so you were one of the key people we brought in just to try to make sense of a world that wasn't making sense. And every week it was like hearing your voice calmed us a little bit. So oh, I'm you. just so <laughs> grateful. So, um, but I, I would love to start here just for those people that haven't heard of you before. I'd love for you to just share a little bit of who's Linda Harvey. What do you do? Wonderful. I'm a veteran dental hygienist, not practicing, but consulting and speaking full time in the areas of risk management and corporate compliance, infection control and compliance in HIPAA and other areas just happens to fall into that realm. So during COVID, like everybody else, we were just reading, uh, constantly reading and trying to understand what we should be doing as we were all facing the unknown. And now, thankfully, we, it's sort of a known entity, right, Kirk? Three years later, we have the end of the public health emergency on May 11th. So many offices have sort of gone back to the way things were. And I would like to briefly say on that note, things really shouldn't be the way they were. Nothing has stayed the same in our world. Technology has changed the way we deliver dentistry and how we communicate with patients. And it's changed the way we perform and carry out all of our infection control tasks as well. So hopefully all the offices listening are still keeping up their strong points when it comes to all the PPE and infection control protocols that they put in place back then. So we don't want to go backwards. We want to keep going forwards. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so let's start with the, what do we need to know today? How different is it from COVID to right now? If I'm a dentist listening and okay. uh, I'd also, well, that's my first question. And then I've got another one after that. So talk, <laughs> maybe speak to that. So what's different now is that the public health emergency crisis is over. So therefore, we're not under all those mandates that we were before about, you know, seeing just fewer patients and making them wait outside during the crisis. But what it means is that also the CDC is not carrying out their COVID tracker, data tracker anymore. So we won't be able to get real time information about what's happening county by county across the country. And that was a key thing that I would use in all my programs, as did my colleagues in this area, to keep our clients and audiences updated. So now it's a matter of having to check with your state health department or your county health department to find out what the COVID statistics in your area in case there's something you should be concerned about. There's no major outbreaks. There is another Omicron subvariant, believe it or not. Um, and it's not, it's more contagious, but it's not as dangerous. So we're going to see COVID just like the flu and season just is going to be here forever. And we have to just keep hoping that um, there's no more virulent strains that evolve. But it's one of those things to be mindful of, just like we are with all the other areas of infection control, Kurt. Yeah, and absolutely. And this is one of those important parts mm -hmm. of your practice. That's why we have Linda 
come in. Now, I, I want to speak to the HIPAA thing because if you're a dentist listening, a lot of dentists go, okay, HIPAA. And they often don't give it the credibility it deserves. And you often have to clean up some of the messes. And the whole point is this. We want to give you best practices and just be on the front end. HIPAA is very serious. It's very much a process in which mm -hmm. you have to check the boxes. And can you speak to that? Certainly. Well, I know that many dentists oftentimes feel like they're smothered by other regulations, federal, state, local, but that's part of doing business. And when you think about HIPAA, they should think about everything that's required, say in the security rule, for example, as best practices to protect their, their data and their business. And along with that comes protecting patient information. We see so many different areas where their ransomware and breaches are just, it's just running amok. And we're staying, we're, we're trying to stay one step behind the, these thieves and cyber crooks as they create ransomware and keep up with our antivirus and so forth and have good controls with having a good um, managed care services IT provider. But the part that I wanted to address today, Kirk, is the fact that the privacy rule, which doesn't get as much attention as the security rule, um, but has been in effect longer than the security rule, is about to change. And this process has been happening now for three to four years at least. And we thought the new privacy rule updates were going to be published in March of this year, but they didn't come. So we're sort of all hanging on the cliff waiting for these changes because there's going to be some expanded patient rights that we have to be mindful of. Yeah. So I'll go into a couple of those if you want, or we can yeah. talk about some timeline. That was my next question was exactly that. What can we anticipate? Now, I know that you're not writing them. You're just helping us navigate yeah. them. But what can yeah. we anticipate? I know, don't shoot the messenger, right? right. So <laughs> with that being said, one of the things that will change is that the um, release of records will change from 30 days down to 15 days. And currently under the federal law, you're allowed to have one extension. So there's a 30-day extension under the current HIPAA privacy rule. But Kirk, that typically violates most state dental practice acts. So you have to look at two sets of laws and rules, if you will, to make sure you're not in violation of your privacy act in your state or your state dental regulations. Well, that date will drop down to 15 days with a 15 day extension. But most of our clients that we work with tell us that they usually get the records out the door within just a couple of days, if not the same day with, as the patient request. At that point, they're able to get it off their, off their plate and they know it's done. So it's not stacking up. So I think that's going to be a big challenge. But some of the other challenges include the fact that we have to be able to give the patient a copy of that record wherever and to whoever they want. So if they want us to send a copy of their dental record to their personal health app, we have to be able to do that. If the patient comes in, not only do they have a right to request a copy of the records, but they could take a video and take pictures of their records. So while we've been harping at offices for years, don't allow any pictures in the back, do so with a very controlled manner because you don't want patients to accidentally get a picture of another patient in their photograph or maybe a copy of your schedule in their photograph, right? But how many parents love to have that picture of their little one for the first time they visit sitting in the chair? So it's, it's, it's something that has to be navigated you know, throughout every practice. But if a patient wants to make an appointment and come in and go through it and get a copy and do all that, that's fine. So just we have to, we'll have to make it work. So those are some examples of some things that are changing. And there's many more areas that will be changing. But to know also that because of the changes, Every healthcare entity is going to have to revise their notice of privacy practices and redistribute it to all existing patients as well as future patients. Mm. And that's a big deal because when there's a substantive change in the law, just like there was when the High Tech Act was passed in 2012, you have to notify patients of those rights. So those are some just a preview of what's coming, not to scare everybody that's listening, but just to be prepared to, okay, when this comes, we're going to have to make some major changes. Yeah. And so the next question, which you pointed to is just overall timeline of what we can expect. Yeah. Unlike COVID where we had to do everything yesterday to try to figure out what we were doing, there will be a specific timeline under the federal law. And that's always the same anytime a new law passes. So when this gets published in the federal register, it will go into effect 30 days after that. And then I believe it's a six month period of time before the enforcement date kicks in. So offices will have a good six or seven months Kirk, to update their policies and procedures, whether they're working with a compliance company, a compliance consultant, or maybe a, a healthcare attorney, whatever the case might be, they'll have a chance to get those updated and get everything implemented and be ready. The main thing I'd like to stress, Kirk, is if you're not working with a critical, credible 
compliance consultant is please don't copy policies and procedures from your friend down the street. <laughs> what? Because they may not, no, you cannot do that. <laughs> I know you're busted. You're so busted. <laughs> No, dentists do that all the time. I'm like, what is this? And, and uh, they'll use words like photocopy. I'm first of all, that doesn't even exist anymore. But they will actually copy things straight I from know. the end. Don't do that. So why? Well, why? And then embarrassingly, they use these bad copies with their patient forms, and it gives them a terrible impression right. in front of these new patients. When you have this nice, beautiful practice that you're all helping them to grow with the ACT dental team, so it doesn't yeah. work too well. Absolutely. So a lot of a lot of changes in that regard. But um, I also want to share, Kurt, how there's been a lot of dental fines last year. Dentistry has been under the microscope and has some big fines levied by the Office of Civil Rights. And just to share a couple of those to give our listeners an idea, it's not that the Office of Civil Rights, who is the HIPAA enforcement agency, is uh, targeting dentistry, if you will say. It's more that our patients are becoming savvy. And as a result, they're filing complaints with the Office of Civil Rights. And where there's merit, then thus follows the investigation. And after that, usually the fine and corrective action plan. So it's very complex. I'd like to go through some of those if you're, and we can Please. share if you don't mind. Yeah. So to start with, back in 2019, the Office of Civil Rights started a program called Right to Access Initiative. And this right to access was really focusing on the patient's rights to get access to their records within the required federal timeline. And so as, as complaints came in from patients and they got investigated by the OCR, there's been a lot of big fines in dental and across all of healthcare for not releasing them in a timely fashion. And here's a couple. One, for example, there's a, a, a corporate group in Georgia that got, that got fined $80,000 because they wanted to charge the patient $170 for a copying fee. Slightly different topic, but same category, so to speak, within that release of records. And the Office of Civil Rights looks at that as being excessive and they don't allow those types of fees. So they got fined $80,000. In Chicago, there was a dentist, um, didn't release the records within the required time frame as well, received a $30,000 fine. Nevada, same thing, release of records, not releasing records, I should say, in the required time frame. That office was fined $25,000. In uh, Pennsylvania, a $30,000 fine to another dentist. And those are just a few of the situations. So can I tell you the backstory? I don't know the backstory of those, but I want to tell you the backstory of what they have to follow after the fact. Sure. A few minutes ago, I mentioned the corrective action plan curve. So not only do you have to fork over this money within 30 days to the Office of Civil Rights, there's no payment plan for $30,000 and $80,000, but you also have to fall under what's called a corrective action plan, a cap. And usually that lasts anywhere between a year or two. And there's a lot of stipulations put in place about what the office is going to do with having new policies, new procedures, training, um, dispersing the policies to their patient, uh, pardon me, to their staff, um, all the different things they have to do. And and also report back as if you're under, um, what's the word I want to say when you're um, probation, when you're under probation. And so it's very similar to having a disciplinary action against your license with the dental board with this kind of corrective action plan. So it's very serious and you've got OCR watching you for the next couple of years. Now, granted, unlike uh, the DEA or maybe a state agency, they don't have the ability to shut down your practice, but they can still make life pretty difficult. So I bet you're interested about social media. I have some good stories there. Well, that was one of my <laughs> questions on social media. Um, keep going on that. And I have a couple more questions I'll ask you. So tell us about social. Okay. Social is really, it's just a challenge for everybody. And it's such a gray area. What can we post? What can we not post? What can we say to respond to a patient who's thanking us for their care and saying that they're happy to be in our practice? Because when we say too much, now we're actually divulging their patient in the practice and there's been a few times where healthcare providers, including dentists, have gotten in trouble for that. Right. So it's really a fine line. What's the etiquette of replying and what's the etiquette of not divulging information? So I think the etiquette of replying has always just been to use that plain vanilla approach. Thank you for your kind remarks or thank you. For, you know, we love, you know, we love having um, we love hearing those, you know, wonderful comments or feedbacks, something sort of gener generic in, in nature, if you will. But what happened to these offices last year, actually there was two last year. And let's see, let me just look at my notes real quick here. Two that I can remember last year and one from 2016. 
All these offices, what they had in common is they responded to a negative review. How many times, you know, does the dentist and the staff look at a negative review and the hairs go up in the back of your neck? Mm -hmm. It's a very personal attack when someone is saying something negative about your practice, especially if their patient memory or their facts aren't correct. And then so the office wants to take it upon themselves to correct the record and they do so on a public forum and a sort of like airing your dirty laundry, Kurt. And when they do, then they end up getting fined and punished for doing so. So it's a difficult place to be because sometimes that patient provider relationship that you all work so hard, you know, with active, the trust, I just saw your email about the trust email with patients and the provider, and that's gone. So nobody in the practice wants to call that patient and talk to them about the issue yeah. and try to resolve through, even if it's not a good resolution, at least get it off, get it offline. So one office from the one from 2016 was in Texas. They were only fined $10,000. But part of the news story that came out was the fact that they had no policies and procedures. They had no HIPAA privacy officer named and they hadn't had training. So even in 2016, although the privacy rules been in effect since 2003, Kurt, okay, they weren't compliant. Maybe the office is newer so we can grant them that, but they weren't compliant. Then there was an office in North Carolina that did the same thing. This patient had posted an anonymous negative review to which they responded and divulged the patient's name, parts of treatment, information about their insurance, and they were fined $50,000. Wow. Yeah, pretty big chunk. But I've got even one that's going to top that, okay? Oh, no. This one comes from California. <laughs> now, we can't top the $50,000, but part of the corrective action plan was the fact that they had to go back all the way to 2014 and remove all their social media postings that had any patient information in it. To the current date wow. so when i saw that it made me think about how the fact that the ocr is stepping up their punitive portion and really making a difference and they're making a statement about what's going on on social media yeah i think the learning here is that anytime mm -hmm. you do get a negative review you will get one if you try hard oh, enough yeah. is to reach out now, listen you can do enough homework to figure out who it is number one if this mm -hmm. is even a real patient and <sighs> reaching out to them Oftentimes, I totally agree with you. They just want to be heard. And mm -hmm. just even if they scream at you, just say thank you, you know, for screaming. Yeah. At you. Don't try to argue with them. Gosh, arguing on, on social media, whether it be with a patient or a friend mm -hmm. or acquaintance is like the worst thing because everybody it's like everybody wants to add a little fuel to this fire. Don't you agree? And there's a, it's a no win situation. Oh, yeah. So you're not even creating a win-win out of it. Even if it's a win that you get the patient to go away quietly, you can't create that on social media. Totally agree. So um, this is like, this is no joke. Our job is not to really freak people out here, but to really emphasize exactly. the importance of best practices. Mm -hmm. Linda, what do people get wrong most about this? Let's say I'm a young dentist. I'm getting started. What do I, what, what typically do I get wrong most? What this. they typically get, what, what they get wrong is in, in today's environment with, you know, money being so tight, there's not any money in the budget for compliance right off the bat. So everybody realizes they need to get like an OSHA manual and they might buy, you know, one to fill in the blank or get something quick, but they don't really know what to do with HIPAA because there's a lot more just a fill in the blank manual that you don't know how to fill in does not make you compliant. Right. So that's where they miss the mark. And also they miss the mark with not being able to afford proper IT services up front from the security rule side. In other words, you need to have, and you must have to be compliant, managed services, meaning that your IT company is watching the hen house 24 seven for any types of threats and vulnerabilities and attacks on your network. Yeah. One group I know uh, puts canary files on the, on the client server, I believe it's on the server. And at that point, those get attacked first. So when the canary files get attacked, then they're alerted that something's going on. So there's all different strategies that the IT companies can use and I think sometimes uh, offices don't appreciate that because they just can't afford it right off the bat. Uh, you know, they can find some free training somewhere, whether or not it meets the, the needs of their practice, they can always check that box. But as you said in the beginning, Kurt, it's just all compliance, not just OSHA and HIPAA, but everything, HR, corporate compliance, everything, DEA compliance. It's so much more than checking a box. Yeah, I didn't even know there was a thing mm -hmm. such as, you know, canary files and- uh, New design to <laughs> Right. And we just yeah. had to have, you know, we have our first policy on security for insurance, mm -hmm. like insurance purposes, just to protect 
us and I'm like, do I have to have this? And uh, yeah. my team is like, yes, we do. This is a real thing that has to be checked. Now, I want to go back to the technology thing. There is a huge sure. movement in dentistry uh, around sharing information, whether it be in study clubs or membership clubs or other dentists with WhatsApp. I don't know anything mm -hmm. about it. Um, but everyone's like, oh, it's completely HIPAA compliant. I thought I'd ask you, what do we need to know about WhatsApp and being 100% HIPAA compliant? Is that true or not true? Well, when you talk about, you can be have secure and you can be secure. You can have apps and so forth like WhatsApp. And even um, there's another one, I'm drawing a blank on the name of it right now, that is compliant from the security section. But are they going to sign a business associate agreement? That doesn't mean that they're HIPAA compliant. A true HIPAA compliant company follows the security rule to whatever degree that's required by business associates and they sign a business associate agreement and they provide training for their team about security and so forth. So while it's secure, yes, it's got a lot of security features to it. I would still be very careful about what you're putting in any of those apps related to patient information. Yeah. Because when you think another thing that ended Kurt with the end of the public health emergency was using these non-compliant HIPAA apps and teledentistry programs for patient information. So this is where doctors will want to split hairs. You know, what if I just put the patient's initials? <laughs> Can I just put the last name? Can I just put the first name? And as a consultant, I can't say yes or no, um, but I can say you should be using HIPAA compliant apps. Tiger text is one that comes to my mind off the top of my head and there's plenty of others. And then you know you're using a HIPAA compliant program. And sometimes some of the patient communication tools that we have now, these different software programs can provide that service for the office too. Yeah, that's really so good look to for know. Something, mm -hmm, look for something HIPAA compliant and they promote the fact they're HIPAA compliant. Yeah, absolutely. I love yeah. it. I love it. Yeah. So this is so helpful. And I know we're going to be waiting to see what comes out here in the future. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely have you back uh, to navigate that. <laughs> sure. um, but any last thoughts you have on what we should be doing today with regu regulatory compliance? Any, any, any last thoughts okay. that you have? A couple things, yes. One is build an accountability into the office and the team, because with the turnovers that your clients and our clients are experiencing and the shortage of team members and hiring folks with no dental experience to come in, you need to build an accountability so your compliance efforts don't get lost. And I'm using a term now that I'm trademarking called compliance memory. Don't lose your compliance memory. So while we're talking about some specifics with HIPAA, you know, social media and release of records, yes, we can talk about those even all day long, but the bigger picture is, Put compliance and safety into your team meeting agendas. Spend three to five minutes there. Make sure that you are laying eyes on those waterline tests, on the uh, sterilizer test. Um, you're, you're checking out what re records request do we have this past, past month. You know, I know when there's a crisis, everybody knows when there's an autoclave failure or something big or big patient complaint but show that you are following up with that. So that way your team is staying on top of those duties. And that way you're transferring the duties to new team members as they come on board and getting them trained as well. Yeah. I love the compliance yeah. memory thing. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, I've seen too many offices lose their compliance memory. So that's a concern for me. It's like Alzheimer's all of a sudden. <laughs> well, the memory was held by a key team member and then the key mm -hmm. team member moved on and took the memory with them. Yes, so. absolutely. Yeah. So it's just one more element of what we have to put in our checklist. So yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Linda, if I'm listening, I want to find out more about what you do. You can help me, right? If I'm a dentist yes. and I own a, like, can you walk me through this? How does this process work? Where do I find out more about what you do? Sure. Well, Kirk, I'll have two different areas that folks can find out. One is our Dental Compliance Institute, dentalcompliance.institute.com for train the trainer programs and membership programs for compliance assistance, mentoring and help. A lot of offices already have their basic OSHA and HIPAA in place, so they may not be needing those services and they might like some additional assistance for coaching when it comes to compliance. So that's a great place for them to be. Otherwise, uh, lyndaharvey.net is our training and compliance program for policies and procedures and one-on-one -on -one office trainings and speaking engagements. So they can find us either location. Yeah. Wait, you have a podcast. You got to mention your podcast. I Come know on. I do. I've got to talk about my compliance divas. Thank you. I'm going to make you an honorary diva. 
I love it. I I love it. You'll kick me out right away, but I'm so excited. No, you're great. You're great. So the Compliance Divas came together during COVID. It's myself, Leslie Canham, Mary Gavoni, and Olivia Wan. And we came together weekly to try to make sense of what was happening so we could give out a consistent message to our clients and folks like you and your your teams with, with your podcast and your live events that we did on Facebook. So after we thought it was all dying down, we said, well, what should we do next? So we came up with this podcast idea. So they will find the Compliance Divas podcast on all their major podcast channels or on the website, thecompliancedivas.com. That's so awesome. I'm so, so happy for you guys. You're doing a great you. service for dentists. I'm uh, I'm just so proud of you. Keep up the good okay. work. We will. We will. Thank you for the encouragement. Absolutely. So um, stick around when we say goodbye to everybody else, but I'm going to encourage you guys. uh, If you're not taking notes, don't worry. That's the jammer on. We take notes for you. So you can flip up to the notes in uh, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts, everything that Linda has mentioned, you're going to see a link to it. You'll see a link to her podcast, a link to her website and a link to those great resources. Check them out. You're going to find she's super helpful, great teacher. um, And it's an important non-negotiable of dentistry. So, and I have no doubt you're going to be keeping us very well informed as, as things change or uh, maybe they don't change sometimes here in the future. So thank you so much, Linda. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening to the best practices show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends. Again, keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. I love them. I get them all the time and we'll keep lining them up. Uh, so that you guys can learn more and you can create a better practice and better life. So until we see you guys next time or we hear from you next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. 